uh, your viva examination in, in, in surgery and uh, your short examinations in surgery is very important. And the main purpose of this presentation is not the exam, okay? So, of course, it's because of the exam that we are organizing these sessions. But the most important thing is this is very critical for your future uh, training as well. Training, further training, and practice, okay? Patient care. That's the center of our attention. So it's patient care. Guilt's an order. So even though, like, we assume this is for the purpose of the exam, but that is not the issue. The issue is that, you know, good patient care. So that's why I think this is a very important session. So pay attention to it. So I will ask you questions because, like, if I display this uh, x-rays, uh, clinical pictures, and everything, and describe them myself in Passover, you are not going to benefit as much. But if you participate, if you challenge yourself, if I challenge you, then you will fix it. Do you get it? How do, how do you want to proceed? Bakke or Zaka? How do you want to proceed? Do you want me to pose questions and wait for your answers and then uh, describe further or shall I present it myself? You can ask us in between. Yes, I will ask. Yes, I will do that. <coughs> I will do that. So that the main reason why I want it to be a question and answer is because like, you know, when it is a bilateral discussion, you will benefit the most out of it. Otherwise, like, you know, if I'm presenting one hour, two hours, then it's meaningless, you know, you may keep some of them, you may forget the rest. So try to participate as much as possible. So for those of you who are new to this session, my name is Fakar Selassie Henok Mogas. So in Ethiopia, Fakar Selassie but here people know me as Dr. Mogas. So I used to be a cardiothoracic surgeon in the Department of Surgery. Now I have moved to the U.S. and I'm doing my internal medicine residency. I'm a senior resident finally. So we will be discussing about radiologic and clinical limits of common surgical conditions. And there may be an overlap between uh, specialties, like between general surgery and neurology, between cardiothoracic and uh, GI, between GI and uh, orthopedics and things like that. So I have tried to be as comprehensive as possible because like, you know, I have been uh, examining medical students for a couple of years before I moved here. And I have been teaching these uh, lectures in, in Black Lion as well for many years. So I have tried to be as comprehensive as possible. So pay attention, okay? So let's start with this one. Okay, it's not progressing. What's going on? Okay, can you troubleshoot? Slide share led, Uh, I don't think so. What do you mean by slide share? No, no, it's like, you know, somehow minimized, you know? Again, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, slide share. The gum in my I couldn't. Okay. Uh, I can't. I can't. Yeah. Uh, okay. Into the slide view, I'll look at it. Huh? Slide. I'll look at it. Okay. Into no, like, as a window, like, no, no, yes, slide window, like, phone, in case, case. Yeah, chat, chat box. I think I am in the not in the chat box, but slide to like one. I think I don't know why. So in the Ghana share window. Okay. I'm so sorry, guys, for the inconvenience. I think I should be able to share now. Yes. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> so what do you think is going on? So this is a normal chest x-ray. So to save some time, I'm going to uh, discuss about this. This is a normal chest x-ray. So these are important landmarks. You can see there is a centrally located air field tubular structure just anterior to the uh, vertebral spines. These white, white structures you see over here, these are the cervical, I mean, the vertebral spines. So just overlying that, 
is this black tubular structure that is the trachea. So the trachea bifurcates into the right main stem bronchus and left main stem bronchus. So the bifurcation point is called the carina. It's a car. It's called the carina. Then the other important landmark structure in interpreting chest X-ray is the diaphragm. So this is a diaphragmatic shadow. There is also another diaphragmatic shadow. So pay attention. So when you go, when you look into the right diaphragm and left hemidiaphragm, so the right hemidiaphragm is located a couple of centimeters above the level of the left hemidiaphragm, and that's obvious. This is due to anatomy, anatomical difference in the abdomen. So basically, the liver is sitting just under the right hemidiaphragm, so the liver is pushing the right hemidiaphragm a little bit to a higher level. So maybe 2 centimeters, 2.5 centimeters uh, higher than the left hemidiaphragm. Okay, so you see some gas shadow over here, that is the stomach. So the stomach gas shadow is located under the left hemidiaphragm. So this structure over here, you see, is the aortic knuckle. So these are like, you know, pretty much straightforward. So I'm not going to uh, discuss in detail how to interpret a chest X-ray because I assume you, you guys know about the interpreting a chest X-ray. So you comment about the bony structures. So you try to find out if there is any fracture or not. You will also comment about the uh, status of the lungs. So these lungs are well aerated and we don't see a gross pathology in the lungs, right? So in the subcutaneous tissue, you have to comment on the subcutaneous tissue and you'll understand it further when you see more X-rays, okay? So this is a subcutaneous fat pad, uh, fat pad. So some abnormalities might be seen like a mass, air in the subcutaneous tissue and things like that. And here we have the clavicle and you have to uh, see if there is any fracture or not, the vertebral column. Sometimes you may be able to see it, especially if it is over penetrated, so you may be able to see the bone. So this is further like, further uh, trying to illustrate the landmarks in the chest X-ray. So this is the heart, obviously. The heart is filled with blood, that's why it's appearing white. So anything fluid, including blood, appears white in plain X-rays, right? So that's why the heart is white. And anything which is filled with air appears black. That's why the lungs appear black. So these are the lungs. So right lung and left lung, they have major anatomic differences. So the right lung has three lobes. So this is the upper lobe. This is the area of the middle lobe. And this is the area of the lower lobe in the right side. Whereas in the left side, you have got the upper lobe and lingula around this area, and you will have the lower lobe, right? So these are like the features. Fissure, this is horizontal fissure, this is oblique fissure, okay? And here we have only the oblique fissure. You don't have the uh, uh, horizontal fissure in the left side. That's why you have only two lobes in the left. So the other one is like, you know, like I said, this is the aortic knuckle. So that represents the aortic arch, the arch of the aorta. And this represents the pulmonary trunk or the pulmonary vasculature is around this area. And this is the area of the hilum, left hilar structure. So that's when you talk about lymph lymph uh, hilar adenopathy. So if there is any prominence, then like, you know, you think you might be dealing with lymph, uh, I mean, hilar adenopathy. So this is the area of the hilum in the right side. So here you have the superior vena cava. So the superior vena cava comes and empties into the right atria. So this is the area of the right atrium, okay? This is the right atrium. This is the area of the right ventricle, and this is the area of the left ventricle. Be below this, this is the left ventricle and the apex, okay? And this area represents the left atrium. So this is a two-dimensional field because like, you know, the heart is a three-dimensional structure. It's not two-dimensional as you see it here. So these are important landmarks. And I was telling you earlier, so here you have the stomach. So this is the stomach gas shadow, just below the right and the left hemidiaphragm. So this basically gives you some idea uh, of what is going on in the chest X-ray, okay? So what do you see here? Now it's a question for you. So what's your diagnosis? Very fast. <clears throat> it's a straightforward. So the normal lung is like this, well aerated. You can see this bronchovascular markings. This is like, you know, uh, the vessel, the vascular structures branching out. That's what is meant by this white small branch are called bronchovascular markings. So 
that is missing here, right? So somebody said pneumothorax, which side? On the right side, excellent, Saka. So uh, you have to be specific, okay? So when somebody asks you what's your diagnosis, you should say, right, pneumothorax, excellent with that. That's how you should answer, because like, you know, is it a left pneumothorax? Is it a tension pneumothorax, simple pneumothorax? So you have to qualify that one. So spot diagnosis, straightforward, right, significant hemothorax. What has happened to the right lung? What has happened to the right lung? <clears throat> so you don't see any lung, right? So this is all collapsed. Excellent, Meron. Yes, with right middle lobe collapse. No, with that, it's not right middle lobe collapse. The entire lung has collapsed. There is no lung tissue here. All this is the air in the pleural cavity, okay? All this is the air in the pleural cavity. It's completely collapsed lung. So this is the lung. This is the lung. It has become almost white, as white as the heart, right? So what has happened? When the lung collapses, it gets only perfused, right? There is perfusion, but there is no aeration or there is no gas exchange happening. It's completely collapsed. So there is no air. That's why it's completely white. Only blood is going because, like, you know, blood will continue flowing to the right lung. So it has become white. It's completely collapsed. You can see it. It's completely collapsed lung. So is there any component of tension, guys? Is there a tension pneumothorax? So this is a significant pneumothorax. And you have to be careful whether you are dealing with tension pneumothorax or not. But if because that really matters for management, right? That's very important. If there is tension pneumothorax, that's emergency. You have to act immediately, right? You don't have to wait. You don't have time. So is there any tension in this patient? Tension pneumothorax. No tension. Excellent. So we will see when tension is present. So if there is no tension in pneumothorax and patient has like, you know, a pneumothorax, so I might ask you, what do you think? Do you think this patient had trauma? Uh, don't say yes, because this is a surgical discussion, you know. <laughs> so the x-rays might be like, you know, brought from somewhere else. Maybe it's Aga said, maybe. But like, you know, do you have any clue for uh, trauma in this? In this patient. So, if it is traumatic pneumothorax, what else do you expect? What causes traumatic pneumothorax? A tear in the lung, right? So, there must be a tear in the lung. Yeah, so how do you know presence of uh, tension pneumothorax in imaging? I will tell you, we have other images, okay? No fracture, excellent. So, there is no evidence of fracture, right? So, we don't see any evidence of fracture. So most probably this is what kind of pneumothorax could it be? Most probably, I'm not 100% certain, but most probably if you have to guess what kind of pneumothorax would it be? Most probably spontaneous pneumothorax, right? So spontaneous pneumothorax, you have to know the causes of spontaneous pneumothorax, right? Spontaneous pneumothorax can happen. There, is, there could be primary or secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, right? So a single chest X-ray, a single chest X-ray with pneumothorax, so your viva questioning or your short exam questions might be based only on this X-ray, okay? So you have to be prepared like this, okay, for the exam. So you have to think an extra step. So what could be the cause could be the next question. So most probably spontaneous pneumothorax. So you have to tell me what different types of spontaneous pneumothorax do you know? It could be primary spontaneous pneumothorax or it could be secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. So primary spontaneous pneumothorax is mainly because of what? Due to rupture of what? I'm waiting until somebody answers. Excellent, blips, blips or bully. Either a bully or a blip, if it ruptures, it gives you primary spontaneous pneumothorax. No trauma, no nothing. There are like this air filled sacs, they rupture spontaneously, and then they result in pneumothorax. So, what kind of individuals are prone to spontaneous, primary spontaneous pneumothorax? How are they described? In what? Yes, male, tall, slender individuals, right? Very tall, young, slender individuals, right? A smoker sometimes, yes, they might be predisposed for formation of these plebs and bully. So what uh, professions might make you prone to develop like, you know, uh, to present with spontaneous uh, primary pneumothorax? Yeah, pilots, pilots, divers, yes, deep sea diving or pilots. Because of a sudden shift in pressure, in atmospheric air pressure, then this blips and bully may rupture spontaneously. Excellent, guys. So you know about it. So spontaneous pneumothorax. Secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. Secondary means secondary to some pathology, right? Can you give me common examples? Uh, 
of causes of secondary spontaneous motorance? Yes, COPD, what else? TB, yes, common, asthma, yes. So tuberculosis is a common cause. So a patient coughing, weight loss, drenching night is waiting, and you see the x-ray and it's like this, you have to suspect, you have to suspect tuberculosis, okay? Especially in our setup. So a patient who has been coughing for more than two weeks, losing weight, poor appetite, deranging night is waiting. He gives you or she gives you the x-ray. It's like this. You think of tuberculosis. Okay. Very good. So secondary spontaneous pneumothorax commonest cause is tuberculosis in our setup. Diagnosis. is called diagnosis. Fast, fast, fast. So like I said, if you answer fast, you can see many slides. I have a lot of slides for today. So if you want to see them all, answer fast. Left tension pneumothorax. Yes, excellent, excellent, Meron. So there is a component of tension. So uh, tension, because you say left tension pneumothorax, excellent, that is a diagnosis. So you see completely collapsed lung, like the previous one, the left lung is completely collapsed, and the entire left thoracic cavity, pleural cavity is filled with pneumothorax. And you can see there is some deviation, right? So. In the, at the very beginning, I showed you the trachea is supposed to be centrally located, right? It's in the center, it overlies these vertebral spines. What's happening here? You can see the trachea is somehow pushed to the contralateral side. And the heart is also not located centrally, it's pushed. Okay? And I don't see any fracture in this one as well, so it could be like, you know, uh, tension happening. So the other thing is like, you know, in the previous x-ray, even though there is a very significant pneumothorax, we don't see any component of tension in this x-ray, right? So, and then in that case, you have to think, am I dealing with an acute process or a chronic process? So most probably, what kind of process is this process? Acute or chronic? Acute or chronic? Just say it, guys. So most probably chronic because like, you know, if it is a chronic process there, maybe some degree of fibrosis going on and things like that. So the, the heart and the other lung and mediastinal structures are not going to be easily pushed to the contralateral side, okay? If it is a chronic process. If it is an acute process and tension develops, you know, the rest of the mediastinal structures will be pushed to the contralateral side. So you can see the heart is somehow pushed to the right side, opposite to the pneumothorax, okay? So we don't see any trauma. It could be, you know, primary pneumothorax. It could be secondary pneumothorax, who knows? I don't see any, any other thing. What do you think about this? What is that? What is going on here? Excellent, flail chest. So what is the definition of flail chest? Flail chest, excellent. So you see multiple ribs are fractured at two different places, right? One place here, another place here. So if two, yeah, it's two or more, okay? Two or more, it's not three or more. So if two or more adjacent, they have to be adjacent to each other, next to each other. If two or more adjacent ribs are fractured at two different spots, Yes, at uh, two or more sites. Yes, I got. So that's the definition of the uh, flail chest. What is the commonest complication of a flail chest? Come on, guys. <coughs> Contusion, excellent. Contusion of the underlying lung structure. So you can see this is a flail segment. So this flail segment is helpless. It's completely separated from the rest of the lung, right? So. It's by its, own, by its own, it's separated from the rest. So this, you are here you have like an you know, flail segment, okay? So, and for somebody to develop a flail chest, a flail segment, what kind of force should be applied on the chest? A simple blue or a very high energy, high impact force, blunt high impact force. That is why the complication is contusion of the underlying structure. You can see somehow the shape, it's kind of 
bruised, right? That's uh, the underlying language is kind of bruised. You can see it's not as pink as this one because like, you know, it's a very high impact applied on the chest wall, fracturing multiple ribs at two different segments at two different sides, resulting in a contusion of the underlying lung, okay? So flail chest, the two or more ribs, flail segment don't have bony continuity, paradoxical movement. So the clinical presentation is paradoxical movement. What is a paradoxical movement? Paradoxical movement means during inspiration, our thoracic cavity expands, right? It moves out. And during expiration, it recoils or it goes inwards. So the flail segment acts, you know, irrespective of this physiologic mechanism. So it just acts, acts by so uh, paradoxically. So during inspiration, it gets sucked in because the intrathoracic pressure increases, it decreases, right? It's a negative pressure during inspiration. So it pulls it inside. It's supposed to expand, right? The chest is supposed to expand, but the flail segment is going to be pulled inwards during inspiration. During expiration, the intrathoracic pressure increases, right? So the flail segment will be pushed outwards. It was supposed to recoil with the rest of the chest, with the rest of the thoracic cavity. But since it is continued, there is no bone continuity and it's separate from the rest of the thoracic wall, it just gets pushed out. So that's what's meant by a paradoxical movement. High association is pulmonary contusion. You know it already, okay? Good, so this is another demonstration. So what do you think is going on in this lung? Guys, what's going on? Most probably, uh, yes, consolidation, that's a possibility. You are right. <coughs> but if you see a rib fracture, which I don't see clearly, but if it is like, you know, associated with rib fracture, which looks like a, which looks like a, um, a flail segment or a flail chest, what do you think? Or like if you see multiple rib fracture, a motor, it's not a motorax, Mahalit. Why not a motorax? If it is a motorax, you need to see obliteration of this angle, right? The costophrenic angle and the cardiophrenic angle. Most of the time, they get obliterated because, like, you know, uh, blood doesn't really flow, unless it's loculated fluid. It, does, it doesn't behave like this, it just precipitates, it just settles due to the effect of gravity. So it obliterates the costophrenic angle. So I'm 100% sure this is not a motorax. Rather it is what? What did you say guys? I missed your comments. Only one person can say it and then I can. Contusion. contusion, excellent, contusion. So most probably it could be contusion, especially if it is associated with the rib fracture, if you see rib fracture, or it could be consolidation. Excellent, differential diagnosis. What do you think is going on here? Full diagnosis, okay? Don't give me partial diagnosis because that's how they grade you. What do you see here? It's obvious, it's obvious. People are, somebody has tried to help you with these arrows, right? Yes, subcutaneous emphysema, excellent. The white arrow represents subcutaneous air, that's why. At the beginning of my presentation, I said, you should also comment on the subcutaneous tissues. Look at the subcutaneous fat, the fat pad. So there is air, air, air. Air appears black on plain X-rays. So subcutaneous air. Subcutaneous emphysema plus flail chest plus contusion. Yeah, it could be. You cannot rule out contusion. You can see like, you know, the air is somehow uh, right, flail chest. Flail chest plus contusion plus subcutaneous emphysema. So this tells you, how significant the trauma is because like to the extent the patient even has developed subcutaneous emphysema. Okay. What about this one? Now, if you notice something, I will give you extra credit. And most probably that person is interested in thoracic or cardiothoracic surgery. I'm giving you a hint. So what do you see in this X-ray? Straightforward. Straightforward. I'm showing you. I'm showing you. I'm showing you something. Eh, tension in motorax? Not exactly. Where is a where is an you don't see tension to say tension? The heart is centrally located, right? 
Nemo mediastinum, uh, this is the trachea most probably. Widen mediastinum, it looks like maybe the film is rotated, I don't think. That's not the pattern. I'm showing you something here, <laughs> here, and here, 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 here. Multiple refracture, excellent, and a spinal damage, no spinal damage. Refracture, lung contusion, subcutaneous. Excellent. So there is subcutaneous emphysema, there is multiple refracture. Subcutaneous emphysema on the right side, subcutaneous emphysema, even to the extent of the neck, a little bit extending to the face, maybe to the neck and to the shoulder. And there is nothing here. There is nothing here. There is no pacemaker. That's no pacemaker. I'll show you a pacemaker later. Do you see these wires? What are these wires? Do you see these wires? Do you see these wires? Do you see these wires? Do you think this patient, patient just you, not just you? I am talking about this one these wires here. Do you see my cursor, by the way? Yes, we can see. So what are those wires? Post of what kind of surgery? Why are these wires here? What are they doing here? So you haven't been following the chest surgeon's smile at now. So this is a sternal wire. So this patient had history of what kind of surgery? What kind of surgery do you think this patient might have in the past? Open heart surgery. I mean, yes, cardiac surgery, excellent. Cardiac surgery, open heart surgery, excellent. Mediastinal surgery for mediastinal mass. It could be for retrosternal goiter. So if a patient has a goiter with a retrosternal extension, you may do sternotomy. So this patient definitely had history of median sternotomy. That's how we call it, median sternotomy. I say that because I see these wires. These are sternal wires, okay? So, you know, you study a lot and somebody might trick you like this. With like, and the, the entire discussion might be shifted somewhere. So be careful on your viva exams and things like that. Be, be an observant, okay? Be an observant, think one step further. So this patient might have had valve surgery, might have CABG, coronary artery bypass graft, might have any mediastinal surgeries like, you know, for thymoma, thymic carcinoma, whatever, you may name it, okay? <coughs> What do you think is going on? It's a maze, huh? At least you can tell me something. It might be difficult to see in detail. Subcutane, very diffuse, right? Very diffuse. Right side, left side, neck, shoulder, bilateral. Very diffuse. Subcutaneous emphysema. How do you manage this patient? How do you manage this patient? <clears throat> the subcutaneous emphysema is everywhere. I had very, very beautiful picture. Unfortunately, I didn't include it here. Included it here. So, clinically, how do you identify subcutaneous emphysema, guys? Have you ever felt a subcutaneous emphysema? Crepitation with crepitation. Crepitus, crepitation on palpation. Excellent. So, when you palpate the area, then this patient is going to be full of air. So it's not good in the feeling. It sounded long, but in the design of feeling, you know, mean or actually just like that. So put as a subcutaneous emphysema feels like that. Where else can we find subcutaneous emphysema other than the chest? The chest is obvious because, like you know, you have got a bag filled with air, which is a lung. Where else can you find subcutaneous emphysema in the body? Limb after fracture. Uh, neck, yes, neck, because like, you know, uh, following thyroid surgery, if you injure the trachea, there may be subcutaneous emphysema. Where else? Limb, due to what? Yes, you are right. You may feel it in the limb. Secondary to what? Necrotizing fasciitis, excellent. So due to what? Necrotizing fasciitis due to what? Be complete. Necrotizing fasciitis or subcutaneous infections as a result of what? What kind of microorganism? Always make your answers complete. Clostridium difficile, yes. Or any other like a perfyringes, excellent. 
Yes. So any gas forming microorganisms, it could be anaerobes, it could be like clostridium interferences and others. So these gas forming microorganisms, if they do result in subcutaneous infection, muscle infection, whatever in the limb, then if you f feel a crepitus, that is gas gangrene. So if the limb is gangrenous and you feel a crepitus, you are dealing with a deadly infection. It's a gas gangrene. It could be spreading fast. The patient might be at risk. So you have to act fast, okay? You have to contact either the orthopedic surgeon or the general surgeon to act on that uh, really fast. So how do you manage this uh, diffuse subcutaneous emphysema? Straightforward answer. Go ahead. Go for it. How do you manage? Simple, simple, simple thing. Don't uh, don't think complicated stuff. No specific treatment, subcutaneous emphysema, positive pressure ventilation. Yeah, you can do that. Like high flow oxygen can help. Lelas. Uh, magnesium uh, managing underlying cause. Okay. Yes, how do you manage the underlying cause? So, pneumothorax, you know, associated pneumothorax. There must be a lung puncture, right? So, most probably, the gills, the gills might be the fracture. Fracture kills the pain. <laughs> kills the pain. Yes, you have to kill the pain, but that is not going to manage the subcutaneous emphysema. So, you have to kill the pain. That is number one. Rule number one, make your patient comfortable so that he or she likes you. Again, you have to manage the subcutaneous enzyme. Simple chest tube insertion, guys. Come on. Chest tube insertion. When you insert a chest tube, one, you may treat the underlying pneumothorax and the subcutaneous enzyme will resolve. In the past, people used to put multiple needles. That is not really necessary nowadays. So, syringe, yeah, syringe is a but now you may convert the patient into the jar to looking like the jar and the jar. So if you manage the pneumothorax with chest tube, that solves the matter. So open pneumothorax, open pneumothorax means you have that two-way direction flow. So the air can go in and it can go out, okay? If it is like, you know, puncture, boletum direction, escape and direct lamsale. Uh, if there is open wound in the thoracic cavity, two possibilities, right? Especially when we're talking about thoracic trauma. There could be penetrating injury to the chest and you may have open wound. So that open wound could be like, you know, a lung air to go in and to go out. So there is no tension, okay? During inspiration, air will go in. During inspiration, air will go out. That's because of pressure difference, right? And simple physiology. Tension in motor acts develops when the wound acts as a valve, a one-way gate valve mechanism create cardiac. So during inspiration, it sucks in air, but during expiration, this flap of tissue, a flap of tissue, will seal that opening. So air cannot escape the thoracic cavity, and the pressure builds and builds and builds and builds gradually with each inspiration, and eventually it just pushes the entire mediastinal structure, including the contralateral lung, to the opposite side. So under the centrally located renal mediastinal structure, including that, will be completely pushed to the contralateral side. We are talking, we were discussing about tension. So some of you who didn't understand the mechanism of tension development, this is a good example. So in order to prevent tension in motor acts from happening, like especially if you are dealing with penetrating trauma to the chest, what kind of dressing do you apply? If you are like in a district hospital where you cannot put a chest tube, the management is like, you know, chest tube, right? Excellent. Three way valve or three side dressing. So you apply plaster in the three directions. For example, if this is a dressing, so you apply a plaster one here, another one here, another one here, and you leave this one open. So during inspiration, what happens to this uh, dressing? It gets sucked in, right, into the thoracic cavity. Whether just to mature the filler is a galmal, no, during inspiration, you know, negative pressure. So during expiration, it gets pushed like this, and it allows air to exit myelin. No. That way you prevent tension in motor acts from developing. So it allows air to go out, but it doesn't allow air to be sucked into the thoracic or the pleural cavity. So three-sided dressing or plaster application with a, you can apply like a simple plastic material when it goes wherever, most of the time good. Three-sided monal, but you don't have to apply the plaster in all the four different directions, or you don't have to leave it open, okay? 
Okay, very good. So pneumothorax, it could be closed pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax. So closed means like you have a refracture, there is a puncture to the lung, but there is no communication with the external overlet. Open pneumothorax means there is a penetrating trauma, there is an open wound, so there is a communication with the external overlet. So even though there is no puncture to the lung, air is coming from the atmosphere. So tension pneumothorax, like I said, if it allows for the air to go in, but it doesn't allow to come out, then the patient develops tension pneumothorax, okay? And the uh, air in the plural space would be increasing and unable to escape, tension develops. What's your diagnosis here? Let's put diagnosis and we'll move on. Diagnosis, spot diagnosis. Straightforward, clear. The heart is supposed to be in the center, a little bit inclined to the left, right? What is it doing in the right? Left tension pneumothorax, yes, yes, tension, massive tension pneumothorax, left, left side tension pneumothorax, excellent. So, so how do you manage tension pneumothorax? Tell me, how do you manage a patient with tension pneumothorax? A, you would sit down by the patient's bed and cry with the patient. B, you shout for help. C, it's a gun said, I will put a needle in the second intercostal space. Yes, you should put a needle, needle decompression immediately. So how do you do it? This is how you do it. So where do you do it? Second intercostal space. Insert the needle into the skin over the surgery. Why over the surgery? Why not under the second rib? This is the first intercostal space. This is the second intercostal space. This is a mid-clavicular line. So second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line over the third rib, not under the second rib, to avoid neurovascular bundle. Excellent. Here you can see the neurovascular bundle running at the lower border of the rib, okay? So simple anatomy, so anatomy 101. So neurovascular bundle running under the rib border. So you avoid the second, the lower border of the second rib. You come over the top of the third rib. You are away from the neurovascular bundle. Here you see the neurovascular bundle, okay? So this is a landmark near clavicular line, second angle of Louis. So the angle of Louis corresponds with the second intercostal space. So you have to palpate for the angle of Louis. In what physical examination do you have to check for angle of Louis? Internal medicine or cardiothoracic surgery. What other physical examination do you feel for the angle of Louis? Cardiac examination to check for what? IVP, intravenous pressure. IVP or the slip of JVP? You, you meant a JVP? Yes, JVP. So when you are trying to measure for a JVP, you have to feel for the angle of Louis. And when you are about to count the intercostal spaces, your first landmark is the angle of Louis. Then the one corresponding to it is the second intercostal space and you go down laterally. Counting for the intercostal spaces, you do that on cardiac examination. Very good. What is the diagnosis? What diagnosis? Now you should give me left pleural effusion. Nope. With that, that's not right. Yes, right. Yes, excellent. Yes, you corrected yourself, right? Hemothorax. Why do you think it's hemothorax? You are right. It's hemothorax, most probably. Why do you think it's hemothorax? Number one, it's obliterating the costophrenic angle. There is clavicular fracture. Excellent, excellent, amazing. Refracture, excellent. There are refractures. There is clavicular fracture. So this is related to trauma. So if it is related to trauma and you see something which is completely white, so I say, like I said earlier, blood appears white on plain X-ray, so it completely appears white and it's obliterating the costophrenic angle. Compare it with the left one. So you see this costophrenic angle? This is very beautiful, unobliterated, acute angle. Whereas here, it's obliterated and it's obtuse. The costophrenic angle is now obtuse and it's completely independent. Why always, oh, somebody, I missed your question. Okay, let me see. Why always right side? Does it really <laughs> left side nation? <laughs> I mean, it's by coincidence. I don't know. I am right-handed maybe. I don't know. I don't know. 
I mean, it can happen in the lid. There is a, uh, don't assume all pathologies happen in the right side. It can happen in the left side. It's just by coincidence, a chance event when I pick these X-rays, okay? So you see blood, oh shit. Uh, uh, what is that? Okay. Do you see it now? I can't. Slide it, Diana. You see the slide? Okay. The problem is I have to interrupt again. I'm so sorry, I'll come back. Oh, for needle decompression, if it is like, you know, in the left side, left side corner, if the tension in the motor axis is in the left side, you will do in the left side because all the neurovascular, I mean, whatever uh, mediastinal structures, number one, you are at the mid clavicular line. You are away, you are not in the center of the mediastinum. Number two, if you are dealing with the tension in the motor axis, that means your mediastinal structures are away from your field. They are pushed toward the right side, so there is no as such risk. So you can put your needle, even if it's left side the tension in the motor axis, you can put a needle in the left side, okay? I think I have to exit this thing again and come back. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. So you see blood here, right? So the costophrenic angle was supposed to be acute. You see, this is a costophrenic angle. It's supposed to be acute. When the blood is occupying that space, this cardiophrenic angle is obtuse, right? This is a cardiophrenic angle. You have cardiophrenic angle here, it's obtuse. The cardiophrenic, I mean, costo maletico, rib maleno, costo phrenic angle, it's acute net. So now it's completely obliterated, it has become obtuse. So there is a right lung, it's partially collapsed, collapsed, there is air, I mean, blood in the, in the lung, in the pleural cavity. So if you remember, one of you said, like, you know, for that confusion, you said pneumothorax, no, pneumothorax, I mean, hemothorax doesn't behave like that because it precipitates at the bottom due to the effect of gravity, it's in the space, I don't know. Like if you pour something in a bucket, it goes at the bottom, right? How touch and it doesn't behave like that. So that's why I say that's impossible for the motor. What's your diagnosis here? For somebody who is concerned about seeing many pathologies in the right side. Massive hemothorax, left massive hemothorax. It could be. Could it be something else? Could it be something else? You are right. Differential diagnosis, tell me. Nimenoctomy, yes, post nimenoctomy changes, it could be. What else could it be? What else, what else? Massive effusion, yes, plural effusion, excellent. Plural effusion, hemothorax, what if? It could also be pus, right? It could be in pyma, it could be in pyma thoracis, it could be hemothorax, it could be plural effusion. What kind of plural effusion, if it is plural effusion, what kind of pathologies would present with this kind of massive plural effusion? Malignancy, yes, malignancy, yes. Malignancy involving your, uh, your uh, plural, right? So plural secondaries can present with this massive malignant plural effusion, yes. So malignant pleural effusion, hemothorax, hemothorax. If you see rib, if you see sub uh, something like a subcutaneous emphysema, definitely that is, that is blood, right? I mean, say rib fracture, cardiac disease, subcutaneous air, cardiac clavicular fracture, cardiac. Those are clues to tell you that that could be blood, right? So some people might challenge you. What do you think? Could it be blood? Then if you see fracture, yes, I think it could be blood because, like you know, I see fracture, so most probably it's related to trauma. Otherwise, the other differential diagnoses can still be entertained. Okay, good. So what about this one? The same thing, right? So very significant effusion. It could be effusion. It could be, it could be blood, right? What else could this be? One differential diagnosis we haven't mentioned. What else could it be? 
Nimonectomy, you said it. I mean, post nimonectomy changes can happen like that. Consolidation, yes, it could be diffuse confusion. Yeah, on the Zainat, Lunum Lob involved in matter consolidation, like at Manichela, then it could be consolidation, could be like this one. And now consolidation demo, it was Sana Air Lenain Chilala. Somehow we may see some air in the background. It's completely white, I don't know, completely white. And now uh, some fluid is collecting and say uh, it's uh, less likely to be consolidation. What else could it be? Could it be a mass lesion? Uh, yeah, it could be like you know malignant lesion sitting in there. So malignancy could be there. Mass lesion lesion. Uh, the same thing here. Uh, no, most probably this is a plural fusion because it's just like you know obliterating the costophrenic, the cardiophrenic angles, and uh, it could be hemothorax, it could be empyema, it could be plural effusion, all are possibilities. I would appreciate you if you tell me what this is. And that means my colleagues in cardiothoracic are doing a very good job. Hematoma, it could be the cyst, it could be Mass, it could be impaima. What kind of impaima is this? If it is impaima, loculated, excellent. If it is not loculated, what did I say? If it was not loculated, this is a chest CT scan. Right? This is a plain chest X ray. So, in the plain X ray, you see that it's just like you know, somehow plural based mass. No, I don't know, something which looks like a plural based mass. So, differential diagnosis is a Loculated hemo, hemo, hematoma, it could be a loculated in pyma, or it could be a plural based mass, Lehonicula. Because, like, it's not typical, it was supposed if it is fluid, freely, uh, 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 free fluid in the plural cavity, it's supposed to obliterate the cardiophrenic angle as well, right? Like in the previous cases, fluid sion, mulula muluna obliterated merago, it's not hanging somewhere. But this one is somehow plural based, so it could be a loculated fluid. It could be a mass, it could be in pyma, which is loculated or loculated hemothorax. Those are possibilities. Those are the differentials. And how does it appear on surgery? What's going on? Which part of the, 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 the body is open here? Hmm? Rural space, so like you know, it looks like like a posterior lateral thoracotomy, maslal. It's the thorax, and then yeah, what kind of retractor is this one? So rib retractor, rib ballerina, self-retaining rib retractor. No, you can see the chest is wide open, and what do you see here? Lung is obviously collapsed. We don't see any lung. What do you see here? Abscess. Yeah, it's pus, pus, and it looks like this. When it is loculated, this is what is meant by loculated. You see, it's loculated, it's localized, it's, it's in, a, in, a, in a sac, a separate sac like this, loculated in a sac. So it appears on the chest x ray, like plural based on omitayen, chest CT will it's because it's contained in a sac. That's why we call it uh, loculated in time. That's why it's not filling the entire plural cavity, it's not obliterating the cardiophrenic angle here. Maybe because it's loculated like this. This is a surgical specimen. You can see the pus, which is contained in a sac, loculated. You see all other loculations here. You may see some blood or some pus here as well. What is this? A combination of two things, right? Straightforward. I see three things here. What, what do you see here? I see something here. I see something here. I see something here. Uh, it could be a cystic lesion. You are right. It could be a cyst with what? What is this white line? Air flow level, typical air flow level. So you may be dealing with differential diagnosis. Now tell me differential diagnosis. Like you said, it could be a cyst, right? What kind of cyst do you know in the thoracic cavity? Yes, it could be an abscess. Hydratid cyst, yes. Ruptured, diaraga, when air somehow, uh, bronco. Uh, uh, cyst fistula calle, air can come into the cyst cavity in the air fluid level in original. It could be hydrated cyst. What else could it be? It could be in pyma and pus, and we call it pyo pneumothorax. 
if it is blood and air, what do you call it? Hemo pneumothorax. So most probably, what do you think is this? Hemo pneumothorax, pio pneumothorax, or uh, ceased lung abscess? It could also be lung abscess because lung abscess can have a deep cavitary lesion, right? And then you may see air fluid level in the abscess cavity. So in this case, hemo pneumothorax most probably. Why is that? Sub yeah, you see subcutaneous emphysema here, I showed you. So there is some degree of subcutaneous emphysema. It could be due to like, you know, trauma, so hemo pneumothorax. Excellent, guys. Excellent, excellent, guys. What is the differential diagnosis for this? In Paima, it could be an in Paima, loculated in Paima, a mass, excellent, Sadania, plural based mass, excellent, Meron, mass on the left with that, excellent, Mahalit, mass, excellent, Mesotelium, Betalium, excellent. So you see, it's hanging high up in the thoracic cavity, right? So now, uh, loculated fluid, Lamalatrasu, typical characteristic, if there was like something going on. Inadequately treated even on a garmanaman kale, yes, but most probably if you see it's a plural based mass, right? There is also some component here. It's arising from the plural cavity, as you see, and there is some distraction of the rib, right? You see the rib being distracted? So this is a CT scan. That's one of the advantages of having a CT. This is a normal, normal rib appears like this. So part of the rib is like, you know, degraded, invaded, eroded. So this is a plural based mass and you see it's completely localized somewhere. So it's a plural based mass. It's not pneumothorax, it is not in pyema or something like that. So now this kind of help gives you an idea. Okay, let's go to the other chapter. So what's your spot diagnosis? Step forward. So before I go to this one, so whatever we have discussed so far, <coughs> thoracic pathologies, and especially related to fractures, hemothorax, pneumothorax, in pyema, whatever. So people might ask you about like, you know, indications for tube thoracostomy or chest tube placement. So I encourage you to you know the indications for, uh, the indications for uh, chest tube insertion, okay? Or tube thoracostomy, you should know the main indications. So we have discussed about the pneumothorax, hemothorax, pneumothorax. Uh, massive subcutaneous emphysema, uh, malignant pleural effusion, and all that. Okay, so all these are indications for tube thoracostomy. If there is no indication for open open chest surgery, okay, or thoracoscopic surgery indicator colona, the initial step as an intern or as a resident, as a frontliner, you can manage most of those pathologies with simple chest tube insertion. Okay, so you got it. You got it, guys. Congratulations. Let's see. Air under where? Air under where? Both diaphragms, right? It looks like, but some sometimes you expect the gastric cast shadow. So if you see this air under the left, you may not really be impressed because it could be part of the gastric cast shadow. But this one is impressive. It's like, you know, you see the diaphragmatic outline, I told you. And the right diaphragm is here, the left diaphragm is here, and you see air under both diaphragms, I would say. You don't expect air in this area because the liver appears white. You don't expect air. So what's your differential diagnosis? Would you be concerned if somebody says, oh my God, that I came with a very severe sudden onset abdominal pain and I'm vomiting. What do you, what do you think? Perforated period. Is it a real emergency? What are the physical examination findings in, uh, in a patient with uh, perforated period? Perforated viscous, yes, that's more inclusive. It could be any viscous. Rebound tenderness, there could be rebound tenderness because there is going to be peritoneal. Board-like abdomen, excellent. Board-like abdomen, it's just like this. Board-like abdomen, rigid board-like abdomen. We call it what kind of guarding? Voluntary or involuntary guarding? We call it guarding, right? Guarding has uh, is two types. It could be involuntary, it could be voluntary. Involuntary guarding, it's not intentional. Involuntary guarding means, Lydia, excellent. Involuntary guarding means it's not intentional. The person is, it's not under the person's control. It's just 
the peritoneal cavity is irritated and then it's bored like okay you can't do any abdominal examination it's tender all over diffuse tenderness diffuse involuntary guarding presence of uh, rebound tenderness and uh, air under the diaphragm that is typical perforated viscous is it an emergency who should be called whom do you have to contact the same thing surgeons excellent Anna Maria, you have to call the surgeon the general surgeon has to come and act yes excellent general surgeon general surgeon yes you are right you don't call an orthopedic surgeon for this right so <coughs> uh air under the diaphragm both uh, there is some component of gastric gas shadow you can see the gas shadows in the rest of the GIT. so there is a very significant air under the triatemi diaphragm but for it to discuss it's a real emergency you have to consult oh i don't know how i uh, well, what's going on don't read <laughs> i don't know how, how i can like prevent you from reading don't read these things so what, what's going on What's your diagnosis? Interpretation. A small bowel obstruction. Excellent. A small bowel obstruction. These are the dilated, distended small bowel loops. What is the landmark? <laughs> it says a small bowel obstruction. What if I am taking you? I can remove this. What if I remove this part? What if I am taking you? Centrally located dilated loops. What else? Volvule conventis. Volvule conventis. What is the characteristic feature of Valvule conventus, the white lines passing across the full width of the bowel are valvule conventus. So valvule conventus, mallet, the entire diameter, no traverse mirror, but you see them, like, you know, one bowel loop is this one, from here to here. So they traverse the entire diameter, the entire diameter, and they are also parallel to each other. So if they ask you, so I see, they may ask you for a diagnosis, and you would say, so this is a small bowel obstruction and people would tell you would ask you why do you think this is a small bowel obstruction but my advice is don't wait until they ask you you can say i believe this is a small bowel obstruction because i see centrally located dilated small bowel loops with a characteristic volvule conventis which are transverse white lines traversing the entire diameter of the small bowel so if you answer this i wouldn't hesitate to give you 100 percent that's for sure, guaranteed. Because like, you know, you didn't wait until I asked you questions. Last time I was like, you know, advising you. When somebody asks you a question, if you know the answer, be confident, give the entire full description of what you see, okay? I think this is a small bowel obstruction because these bowel loops are dilated, they are centrally located, they are multiple. And I see the typical volvule conventis, which are wide, parallel to each other, traversing the entire diameter of the bowel. If you answer this, you know it. It's not that like somebody and then they are better like how much money that I get. Volvule conventis, I go and I'm in the right way. Then when you come in, volvule conventis, without even knowing what volvule conventis is. Okay. So if one way we would differentiate whether you know this for sure or not, or you are guessing, is with your confidence and how you describe things. Okay. What do you think is going going on here? in the left side and in the right side. So we are dealing with a small bowel. We see the valvule conventis. You see this? Valvule conventis are parallel to each other. They are traversing the entire segment, I mean, diameter. They are wide, okay? And whereas here, it's a big, the caliber is also important. So this caliber compared to this one, this is large one for sure. And the other one is, you see the hostile markings Okay, so the host regions are these ones, you see them? So they are opposite to each other. There is one here, there is another one here. There is another one here, there is one here. There is another one here, there is one here. They are opposite to each other. They are not parallel to each other like this one. These are parallel to each other. These are opposite to each other. One here, another one here. One here, another one here. And they are not traversing the entire segment. It stops here, right? Whereas this one traverses the entire diameter. So these are host reactions. These are volvule conventis. Host markings are typical of large bowel obstruction. Volvule conventis are typical of small bowel obstruction. 
and the location of the bowel distribution. This is centrally distributed. This is somehow located in the periphery. Large bowel obstructions, the dilated bowel loops are somehow in the periphery. And uh, you may see, okay, I will show you another X-ray before I take it. So large bowel, peripheral position, few loops, incomplete rings or ostrations, small bowel, central position, many loops, complete rings, valvular convents. What about this one? What's typical here? How do you describe ex this X-ray? You have to say this is a small bowel obstruction because I do see centrally located dilated loops with a step ladder appearance, multiple air fluid levels, which are centrally located in a form of a step ladder appearance. Look in the dereja, Adalam, and doozy, and doozy, and doozy, and doozy, like a step ladder, step ladder appearance, multiple air fluid levels, which are centrally located, typical of a small bowel obstruction, even though you don't see volvulate convents, okay? Centrally located bowel loops, a multiple air fluid levels which are centrally located, most probably small bowel obstruction. And the other important thing is you don't see any rectal gas shadow. If it is like you know complete small bowel obstruction, you wouldn't expect any gas shadow in the rectum. This is the area of the rectum. Absence of rectal gas shadow. Multiple small bowel, I mean, multiple air fluid levels centrally located, the step ladder appearance, complete small bowel obstruction. <clears throat> there is nothing coming to the distal segment of the bowel, the GIT. What about this one? What is this? How do you describe it? Diagnosis and appearance. Radiological appearance plus diagnosis. Coffee bean, excellent. This is a coffee bean. It looks like the coffee bean. This is the division. Sigmoid volvulus, excellent. So coffee bean appearance is typical of small bowel. I mean, uh, large bowel obstruction, specifically sigmoid volvulus. So you are dealing with sigmoid volvulus because you see a coffee bean appearance. You see the distribution is lateral. Typical, very typical coffee bean, right? Or what is the other radiologic sign? When you see this, this is a coffee bean, Adam. Mahalai lek kanda dabunna santak kalano. Omega sign, excellent. It looks like the omega or inverted U, excellent. You guys are ready for the exam. You don't need this lecture, I guess. So, inverted U, coffee bean or omega sign. Everything describes. Sigmoid volvulus. This is how it happens. So the sigmoid volvulus has occurred. And what's going on? Do you see any complication as a result of the sigmoid volvulus? <clears throat> yes, it's becoming ischemic, right? Because, like, you know, it's twisted along its own mesentery. That means it's cutting off its blood supply. Venous return would be affected first. And then later on, as the pressure builds and builds in the bowel wall, the arterial supply will be cut off eventually, and then the bowel starts dying. Sigmoid volvulus may complicate with ischemia, and it could become gangrenous. When it is gangrenous, you call it gangrenous sigmoid volvulus. When do you suspect gangrene? In a patient who presents with typical signs and symptoms of large bowel obstruction. So you saw a coffee bean appearance, patient is not passing, yeah, presence of fever, yes. Tachycardia, excellent, yes. What else? Tachycardia, the, uh, pain, colic. The pain could be there all the time. Blood per rectum, excellent. When you do like you know digital rectal examination, if you see blood, think of ischemia. So because the mucosa starts dying first, right? So you may see some blood coming. So when you do rectal tenderness, rebound tenderness. Yes, the presence of diet tenderness, the presence of rebound tenderness. And uh, duration, duration is also important. If a patient with sigmoid volvulus comes in, uh, after five days, there is a very high chance of ischemia or gangrene. So pain becomes persistent. Persistent pain, tenderness, rebound tenderness, tachycardia, fever, longer duration, and patient is septic and all that, so you have to suspect. And digital rectal examination, you see blood in your finger, 
You have to suspect gangrene and sigmoid volvulus. Then if it is gangrene and sigmoid volvulus, what should you do? What should you do? Surgery, of course, surgery follows that. If you do surgery, okay, what's my name? I'm going to do surgery or the you are acting like a butcher, Malan. Okay, so surgeons shouldn't be mechanics, they should think. Stabilize excellence. Okay, you have to resuscitate the patient first because the patient is already septic, has developed peritonitis, most probably his, his or her hemodynamics is affected. So we have to stabilize the patient first before laparotomy, before surgery. So secure IV line, resuscitate with IV fluids, maintain. Uh, I mean, make sure that the patient is able to protect his airway magnetum. Distend and non dandy, but and distension is significant. Enough. So they may start vomiting. Most it's not typical to vomit in a, in a sigmoid volvulus, but sometimes it can happen. And uh, they shouldn't aspirate. So as you have to make sure you are putting an NG tube so that you do compress the, the proximal segment of the bowel. And now when you do compress the bowel, if the the distinction is significant, the pain is going to be significant. So the decompression helps you in two ways. During surgery, when you intubate the patient, the chance of aspiration will be minimized. And number two, by decompressing the bowel, you are like, you know, decreasing the intensity of the pain. You make the patient comfortable by decompressing it until you do the surgery. And uh, you have to resuscitate the patient, okay? Resuscitate, resuscitate, and then they call the surgeons, and then the surgeons have to do something. So if it is a simple, straightforward sigmoid volvulus, what do you do? What is the management? What is the management? Simple, straightforward. Somebody comes after four hours of uh, the onset of abdominal pain. Rectal tube deflation. Yes, in the ideal overlap, GI people do sigmoidoscopy or, or whatever. So they do sigmoidoscopy because it's diagnostic. So what is the cause of this rotation? In our setup, most of the time, it's just a benign redundant bowel, which is twisting us along its own mesentery. But there could be mass lesion, whatever other diagnosis might also be there. And you are doing it under direct vision, so you minimize trauma to the to the bowel, so you don't power for it or something like that. If you see some ischemia, you abandon the procedure. So sigmoidoscopy and deflation would be the ideal, but short of that, in most centers, we don't have access for sigmoidoscopy. So we do rectal tube deflation, okay? Rectal tube deflation. Have you ever done, how many of you have seen rectal tube deflation being done? Yes or no? <clears throat> how many of you have seen, so anybody? Yes, yes, yes. I'm looking for yes. Thanks, thanks to the pandemic, you guys are shying away from clinical environment, right? I hear you. I mean, no, yes, Meron, you are honest. So what, what will happen to you if your first rotation is surgery as an intern? Your first, first patient is sigmoid volvulus. So this is, that is the reason why at the beginning I said this is not only for your exam, this is also for your future practice as an intern, as well as as a general medical practitioner, okay? This is very important. This discussion is very important. So if you have never seen, then you have to try to make it up for it. And my internship like more vigorous more now. So stay, stay with like, you know, the surgical residents when you are doing your surgical rotation and try to see when they do these deflations because you will be embarrassed if you cannot deflate a sigmoid volvulus in the district. That is very important to the patient because if you are, for example, let's say in Somali region and there is no surgeon over there, patient comes with sigmoid volvulus, you saw this coffee bean appearance, you made the diagnosis, patient comes early, but you have never done rectal tube deflation, so you are not confident, you don't do it. You refer the patient somewhere, maybe higher or Jigjiga or somewhere, Jigjiga. So when that happens, you are you are just like you know killing that valuable time to the patient. I don't know. Say if you're not better, better. So, but transport again. The line or a church, you know, it's a summer to Savasu scheme at a transportation skip for like a couple of hours may and my may pass because by the time the patient reach a harer or jigjiga or somewhere where there is access to the general surgeon, it may be late. The simple sigmoid volvulus has complicated with. Gangrena sigmoid volvulus. That's very unfortunate. So you will never forgive yourself. 
So please make sure that you see these procedures before you graduate from the medical school, okay? As much as possible. I know the pandemic has like, you know, limited your access to to practice, but like, you know, that shouldn't be your excuse. Now you guys have got the vaccine, so you should be fine. And always keep your mask on. Mask on. If you have N95, you should be good. And add some, some Google or something like that. Be mindful, protect yourself. We want you to be safe. But at the same time, try to gain as much skill as possible, okay? Okay, very good. What's your diagnosis? And we'll pause here. What do you see? You see something here? Yeah, some sort of large bowel obstruction, uh, peripherally located. Now, what is this? Which part of the large bowel is this one? The transverse colon. The transverse colon now. And now your anatomy ratio of transversely lie other than you can see the descending colon here. Adam. Is this plenty fracture is there? And you see the see the descending colon kazawala, a sigmoid colon on an ayongin, erectal gas shadows to the tagenal. You see these hostile markings. I don't know, go as a trend actually, these are hostile markings. So that's a diagnosis. How's it going so far? Are you guys happy? Yes, we don't know. Are you enjoying the discussion? Yes, yes, yes. So do you want to continue? Yes. I will give you one or two minutes break, okay, because before I jump into the other presentation. Somebody, go ahead. Go for it. But I'm a Saganalas Adania. Nice meeting you, okay? They last us. Dems are chulless mouse. Bazam robot alamona chuna raga catalona. Ahona onuka, I'm not robot vela sign maragal, but when you go online. So, am I talking to human beings? Dems are chuna summonist. Crowd. Say something, Browns and Lacan. Go for it. Oh, I am Malaku, I am in the library. Is she Malaku? Good. Browns and Lacan. I am a Palal. Anna Mariam, thank you so much. Mali to Palal. Mali, thank you, thank you. We did a Palal. With that, nice meeting you guys. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. I had a question. For all the fall, for all the others. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm listening. You perforation, Hono, because Tomak Kahona. Uh, do we see uh, air under the left? Custom account. Pudi perforation. most of the time, which part of the. Oh, custom original custom account. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, as far as the air is leaking, it's in the peritoneal cavity. And now, Kahona uh, GI tract, air is leaking. It could be stomach leonichilal, duodenum leonichilal, jojanum leonichilal, colon leonichilal. The cha air is kept yara laganum alanona. Most of the time it tends to go up parallel air or the la hero under the diaphragm and now at And now still the stomach can be on perforated at a rago. You may see air under the diaphragm in the right side, madam. The left side, bizumore and another the madam, McNatum. I may argue, oh, this could be gastric cashar or leonichilal begil, taratarachilal. And now most of the time, you'll definitely see hey, uh, air under the left diaphragm, uh, more pronounced, more air leaks. Tenish air and button under right hemi diaphragm, gold tat tagalis, because it's a kari, minimum air expects the manner of madam. Did this answer your questions again? No, man, it's a yakanyan. 
Yes. <coughs> Did it answer your question? Okay, good. Shall I continue? Rigidity and guarding. Rigidity is not guarding. Yeah. No, I rigidity is not guarding. I do rigid. I don't Abdominal wall is rigid. Board like him. No, no, no. No, guard the other region. And then the patient is not But I am severe abdominal pain. I am so. Palpate the taragus at the chill. Ah, Lee no richelance. I don't know. After surgery. And the differential diagnosis is recent laparatomy. Recent laparatomy or laparoscopic surgery. Kale. Laparoscopic surgery line, area of insufflate area galore, uh, laparatomy line, uh, the abdomen was open or the peritoneal cavity was exposed to the atmospheric air and some air could be there. So if it is post laparatomy patient symptomatic alone, typically it's critical and as sentinel and theoretically again, it's possible. Uh, we don't worry too much. Uh, now I was answering something, uh, guarding and rigidity. So uh, rigid honal, na? Guarding and the law and the physical examination finding guard the other regal. Lamisali voluntary guarding in Mibalo, Haitian to anxious for more. Sendina cow, cane on a minna babis but maslus lemis some away slemis some mud, who that chon with the rather gal, Lazano distract the managal chon, does the other woman go to Tunila chon and Gulbeta chon and death for another gal and hippachon and Gulbeta chon in an attempt to make the abdomen less things malanon. Voluntary guarding and involuntary guarding and all. We may get a child if the board like diffuse and the patient is not doing anything to uh, tense their abdominal wall, then that is involuntary guarding. And now rigidity, man, no. And no. It's another word, another description. Shall I go on? Okay, let me continue to the other chapter. What is going on here? Don't see this side, okay? Uh, the right side, just see this one. What did you say? Uh, I was raised the hand. Okay, who said that? Somebody raised the hand. You can't talk. You can't talk. Raise the other record. June, raise the other record. So you can't talk. For foreign body aspiration, ingestion, is it a swallow or aspiration? How long do patients sustain pure after laparatomy? The unimportant question, so calaparatomy, well, it depends on the indication. So uh, did you do small bowel resection? Did you do large bowel resection? Was it just for peritonitis or you know, any other reason, appendectomy now? What kind of laparatomy did you do now? How long do you keep them in the pure? Does uh, that matter? Somebody I know last name or middle name, you didn't know? Raise the other You can go ahead and talk, don't worry. Somebody, whoever has raised the hand, you can talk if you want to talk. Okay, so this is a foreign body aspiration or a foreign body swallow? Shit. Foreign body swallow? Foreign body swallow. Uh, why do you think that's a foreign body swallow? Because if it was in trachea, it linear. Uh, yeah, it's tricky. No, I don't, what else do you need? I'm um, further characterize the mark. Lateral, lateral x ray. Always be just say, I, I, I need a lateral x ray. It could be aspiration, it could be it could be in the esophagus, it could be in the trachea. So I need a lateral x ray, and the lateral x ray somehow defines the orientation. So you can safely say this is in the trachea, this is in the esophagus. If it is like, you know, completely behind the tracheal gut shadow, then it's in the esophagus because the esophagus is anatomically located posterior to it and anterior to the vertebral column, and the trachea is anterior. So that defines the anatomic landmark. So most of the time, our sun team, most of the time it goes to where? A majority of the patients, I'm not saying 100%, it can go both ways. That most of the time, what kind of foreign body uh, associated uh, pathologies do we see? A swallow, right? Most of the time, they come with a swallow. Yes, they just ingest it, swallow it while they are playing. And most of the time, so what kind of history do you ask the parent? Key history, which would help you 
Choking, yes. If somebody choked, what does it mean? What does it mean if the child has choked or the adults? Sometimes adults also do come with foreign body aspiration as well as foreign body swallow, right? They may also present like that. Yeah, most probably it's going yeah, most probably it's going to the airway, right? If somebody is coughing and coughing and choking for a long time, so that means something has gone into the airways and it's irritating the airways. That's why they are responding with repetitive cough and choking episodes. So that's the key history. And then you do the x-ray, you see it, then like, you know, it's sitting in the esophagus or in the airway, in the bronchus, it could be anywhere, depending on the size, right? So this is how it appears. So where is it? Where is this something? In a bank? Yes, it is in the esophagus. It's, it looks like it is in the esophagus. We don't see the tracheal or bronchial rings. So there is something sitting there. So how do you take it out? How do you take it out? What instrument do you use to take it out? Endoscopy, yes, endo you can remove it endoscopically. Endoscopically. How many different types of endoscopies do you know? The answer is two. What and what? Rigid and flexible. So most of the time, like we use rigid endoscopy to remove foreign bodies because, like, you know, the rigid endoscopies do have wider lumen and lacho. So you can introduce your forceps through a wider lumen and then you can you can grasp and take it out. So rigid, rigid bronchoscope or rigid esophagoscope, most of the time they may be preferred for foreign body removal, but the challenge is if you are going to use rigid bronchoscopy or esophagoscopy, you have to use what kind of anesthesia? Local, regional, general, spinal? GA, yes, that's unfortunate, right? So it might require general anesthesia, Patients should be intubated and all that. So then you would introduce your rigid endoscopy or bronchoscopy and take it out. But like, you know, our GI colleagues can also do a flexible bronchoscopy with simple sedation and they may try to grasp it and take it out. And if it is located in the pharynx, when you are trying to intubate a patient to do rigid endoscopy, bronchoscopy, you see this, uh, this, um, the tip of the something in the in the pharynx. What do you do? Do you go ahead and intubate the patient, or you can remove it by something else? You can remove it by using something else, right? What kind of equipment? No intubation. So, what do you use? Laryngoscope. Laryngoscope. Of course, you use laryngoscope. No, laryngoscopy is not going to take it out. So how do you grasp it? What kind of instrument would help it? You use a laryngoscope, of course. What kind of forceps is that? Excellent. Betalehe, magil forceps. Here is a magil forceps. So here is a magil forceps. So you go, using your laryngoscope, you push the tongue and all that to the left side, and you look inside, you see the tip of the santim or the coin, then you, you ask for a Magill's forceps, you go in, you grasp it, you take, you take it out. That's what we do most of the time. So this is one of the procedures we used to do as a general surgery resident at night. What's going on here? It's for diagnosis, for diagnosis. Foreign body aspiration. So this is most probably aspiration. Where is the foreign body? It says in the right main stem bronchus, right? So I told you this is a trachea. Around here is a bifurcation. So this is the right main stem bronchus. This is the left main stem bronchus. Something is sitting in the right main stem bronchus. That's foreign body aspiration in the right main stem bronchus. You have to do bronchoscopy to get take it out. And why is the right side more common? Because it's more acute angled. And it's kind of like, you know, in direct continuity with the trachea, right? right? 
Whereas the left one is like angulated, there is some angle, so it's less likely for the aborian body to go to the left. But it doesn't mean that left bronchial aspiration doesn't happen. It can happen. Aspirations can happen in the left lung as well, <coughs> and the left bronchus as well. The commonest is the right side. And the reason is anatomical difference, okay? Where do you think is the foreign body? This is an endoscopic view. So where do you think is the foreign body? There is a foreign body sitting here, right? Subglottic, excellent. This is epiglottis, right? This is epiglottis, these are the vocal cords, right? You see the vocal cords? So this is subglottic, excellent, excellent. Just it's high in the trachea. So this is an aspiration, this is not a swallow. It's just in the hypo uh, larynx, just below the vocal cords. Okay, what's going on? What kind of x rays is this? What kind of x ray is that? What kind of x ray is that? Yes, APN lateral. Yes, it's APN lateral, but what kind of APN lateral is the question? Barium swallow. Yes, it's a barium swallow. Thank you so much, Saka. It's a barium swallow. This is normal study. It's this one is AP. This is lateral. So you can see the normal caliber of the esophagus. It's coming to the stomach. So it's a barium study. So in another words, it's a contrast study, right? It's a type of contrast study. This is another one. Normal caliber, smoothly outlined esophagus, smoothly outlined esophagus. It's not dilated, so it's normal. You can see the diaphragm here. You can see the diaphragm here. That's one way you can argue that this is a barium swallow, not barium enema. Somebody might say, could it be for barium enema? No, it can't because I see the diaphragm. I see the ribs. So this is in the chest, okay? It's not in the belly. This is also another one. So you see the ribs, you see the ribs here. Normal caliber esophagus. So uh, fluoroscopy, you know, this is under fluoroscopy. So if you are doing in a flow, if you are looking at it in a fluoroscopy monitor, this is how you see it, the contrast appearing black. And you see it in real time going down. But if it is a film, printed film, contrast agent to metal, normal caliber now. Here we have the diaphragm. This is like most probably. A G junction, gastroesophageal junction, this is a thoracic cavity, normal barium study. What's going on here? So I showed you the normal apple core appearance. It's not typical apple core appearance. I tricked you, I showed you the apple. But this is not the typical apple core appearance. This is not the typical apple core appearance. It could be, it could be used. So somebody might argue, you are right, you may be right. You may be right. But this side, this one, it doesn't look like apple core, right? It looks like mass is growing only in this side, right? This one seems smooth, but there is some very, very rugged surface here. It could be up. Maybe this is not the right way to represent, but like I'm trying to demonstrate, if, it, if the mass is growing only in one side, it looks like this is the area of the mass. This is a normal one. Okay, so the apple might be eaten in one direction. And, oh, but I didn't like the taste, you may stop. And the mass is growing this side, this side is okay. So it may appear like this. We call that feeling defect, right? So this is a feeling defect. It was supposed to be filled by the contrast like this, right? The contrast was supposed to fill the entire lumen. But in this case, there is a feeling defect because there is something growing in mass. Benign lesion, malignant lesion. It's probably malignancy because you see rugged surface, feeling defect, and shouldering. It looks like a shoulder, right? If you consider this is a neck, this is the thorax of the patient or the individual, thorax, neck. This one looks like a shoulder, right? 
This one looks like a shoulder. This one is a shoulder. This is a thorax, torso. This is the neck. If we assume there is shouldering, there is feeling defect, shouldering, mucosal irregularity. So that is typical for a malignant lesion. Okay, so if uh, Dr. Ayale or Rahanu Naga or any of the surgeons ask you, what do you see? There is shouldering, ragged surface, mucosal irregularity, shouldering, feeling defect, most probably malignant lesion. And specifically, it's esophageal carcinoma. There are different types of esophageal carcinomas. You know the types, right? Histologically, right? Squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma. Those are the commonest. So probably this one looks like this one, right? So even though the orientation is not as if the, the apple is positioned. So let's assume this is where there is no mass. So the contrast is going. Assume this red part of the apple is a contrast. So that is a smooth, right? The wall is a smoothly outlined. But in this side, there is going to be feeling defect. This area is the one which is occupied by the mass. And do you see this ragged surface? The inner part, the growth is irregular. So that's how it appears. Ragged surface here, right? And there is a feeling defect here. At least there is a feeling defect up to here. So mass is growing, mucosal irregularity. This side is intact. So it is a smooth, as if this part of the apple is intact. So half of it is equal. What about this one? What about that one? This is the apple core. So the apple is eaten in all sense circumferentially. So only the core is remaining. That means the mass is growing from different direction, it's obliterating, and then it's only the center which is spared. So the contrast is trickling down this one. So the, the contrast is trickling in the center. Mass is growing here, mass is growing here. There is mucosal irregularity, mucosal irregularity here. Feeling defect here, feeling defect here. There is shouldering. You see this shoulder, 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 neck, torso. There is shouldering, mucosal irregularity. It's only the center is filled. Bilaterally feeling defect. Typical upper core appearance. But is this esophagus? Where is this X-ray? What kind of X-ray is this? What is the organ demonstrated? This is a colon, yes. So apple core appearance can happen in the colon. So this is a colon. You are dealing with the colon cancer, colon mass. This is the most probable barium in MR. Okay. I had also apple core appearance for esophagus. Where did it go? I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I missed that, but I think I deleted that slide. I will add it when I share this slide. So esophagus can also have apple, apple core appearance. Colon also can have apple core appearance. I had that image. I don't know. I lost it when I was editing the slides. So the same thing. So apple core appearance of the colon, typically, you see? Because this is fluoroscopy, I told you, right? So when you are watching the fluoroscopy uh, monitor, so the contrast is black, but when it is a printed film, it's white like this. Contrast, contrast appears white. Okay, let's put diagnosis, guys. Go on. Okay, excellent. Then describe the, the uh, X-ray appearance. Rat tail, yeah, it could be rat tail. Or Bird beak, excellent. You saw the rat, I think. Do you see the rat? <laughs> rat tail appearance. So this is dilated. So this is the dilated part of the esophagus. And it appears that there is obstruction here, smooth tapering. That's how we describe it. Proximal dilatation with a smooth tapering of the lumen. Smooth tapering. There is no mucosal irregularity. There is no shouldering. Okay? There is no shouldering, a smooth proximal dilatation. You see, guys, a smooth tapering, no mucosal irregularity. It appears as if rat is sleeping here. This is the body of the rat. This is the tail of the rat. Rat tail appearance, guys. And you see the diaphragm here? That's how you know they are dealing with esophagus. This is the diaphragm here, guys. Diaphragm here. <coughs> what about this one? If I create an eye, eye which I'm resuming on a tail, corner, a tail, no. As you got eye in a Sarah Minimus, like, Kansas Admiral. 
ከበራሪ ከበራሪ እንስሳት ባርድ ባርድ ስፒክ አፕየራ ፕሮክሲማል ዳይሌቴሽን ስሙዝ ታፐሪንግ ስሙዝ ኤንድ ግራጁዋል ታፐሪንግ ዲስታል ኢሶፋጋስ ኢዝ ናሮ ሲ ሶ ኢት ኩድ ቢ ራቴል ካን ዲስክራይብ ኢት አዝ ራቴል ኦር ባርድ ስፒክ ጉድ ጋይስ ሶ ዩ ሲ ዌር ባርድ ኢዝ ሄር ሶ ኢት ሉክስ ላይክ ዘ ቢክ ኦር ዘ ባርድ ፕሮክሲማል ዳይሌቴሽን ስሙዝ ታፐሪንግ proximal dilatation smooth tapering typical bird sign bird beak sign atelia dilated esophagus tight bird beak lower esophageal sphincter another one bird beak atelia another one proximal dilatation so this is a mega esophagus are right? usually dilated esophagus it's becoming like and on diaphragm battayu lela kal rib battayu you see the rib right it looks like the sigmoid right so because you see the rib here you see the diaphragm that's why you would say this is esophagus because it's in the chest that you can see in the look and the hostration see ya ya no ada hostration so it looks like the sigmoid colon so sigmoid esophagus or sigmoid mega esophagus ibanal differential diagnosis for this differential diagnosis <coughs> differential one is achalasia okay achalasia lelas what else esophageal cancer oh esophageal cancer ma yonebe bizu miknat alle miknatu ma andenya smooth tapering ayinorin be esophageal cancer kedem yasayiwachu neber ullo yellam smooth tapering ayinorin be cancer shouldering ayinoral mucosal irregularity ayinoral nazu ullo yellum izilay kandegena demo esophageal cancer is like aggressive no fast no bro mi yaregaw na the esophagus doesn't have enough time to dilate this much okay it cannot dilate this much structure less likely motility disorder ya yeah, motility disorder are la kelija sigmoid or mega esophagus are and common common adellem magarachin theoretically tim awkallebach no diverticular somebody saw this presentation and said diverticular no infective esophagus chagas disease excellent chagas disease yes chagas disease it's common in the rural uh, areas of the uh, south america okay what is a parasite the uh, trypanoma cruzi yes excellent trypanoma cruzi can result in chagas disease and one of the manifestation could be my guys of agus and the other part of the colon with the with the other part of the git which can be affected is a colon i told you already so mega colon mega esophagus are manifestations and what other part of the body can be affected by chagas disease something the in the heart the, uh, yes heart excellent excellent so there could be cardiac manifestations the colon being could be mega colon mega esophagus so and uh, if there is any history of travel to south america you have to suspect Uh, you see this the diverticula gilsa no diverticula diverticula by definition is an outpouching right so there is an outpouching right and there is a set contrast continuous which part of the body are you looking at esophagus that is esophagus part of the body neck excellent because you see the clavicle right the ribs are down here you see the clavicle here you see the cervical spine here so it's in the neck so that's why the anchor diverticula happens in the neck right the anchor diverticula is in the neck it's also called calcium diverticula or it's also called pseudo diverticula because it's a false diverticula it's not a true diverticula only the mucosa and the submucosa are like protruding okay So you see this the diverticula is here it's in the neck sitting in the neck it's sitting in the neck here is a diverticula it's protruding through the pharyngeal wall 
Do you know the area, the defective area, the name of the defective area? Then What do you call that weak point where zenkars happen? Crico pharynges. Achilles dehiscence, bala. Achilles triangle, wayem Achilles dehiscence, bala. It's a junction between, between, I mean, it's between the two parts of the inferior constrictor muscle of the pharynx. And now, inferior constrictor, all that part allo, tyropharynges and cricopharynges. This is the tyropharynges, this is the cricopharynges, and this is the defect area. So that is a Killian's dehiscence allo, but you know, it occurs at that spot. <coughs> Killian's triangle, ballo, and Killian's dehiscence, ballo. Anatomy is very important in surgery. That's typical. So that is, do you know the reason why people with Zenkers develop dysphagia? Why do they develop dysphagia? Their presentation is dysphagia, right? At the neck, blockade. Compression, do you see? So this diverticular sac is full of the contrast, right? Like this. Whatever the patient is swallowing, it could be fluid, it could be food, it could be saliva, is collecting the diverticular sac. Then, due to the effect of gravity, it comes and rests on the distal segment of the esophagus. So it pushes it externally. So you see how the esophagus is narrowed down here, around here? So that causes the dysphagia because it's loaded with food, debris, fluid, saliva. It pushes it from external compression. That's why smooth. The esophagus doesn't have any ragged surface. It is a smooth because it's external compression. <coughs> That's the anchor's diverticula. What other locations do you know diverticula can happen in the esophagus? So this is a Killian's triangle. You see, this is a defect between the tyropharynges and cricopharynges muscles. And it protrudes through this defect. And it compresses the distal part of the esophagus. You see, it just pushes it just pushed the distal esophagus and narrows the lumen. That's why they developed this phagia. This is Zenkar's diverticula. It's not a true diverticula, it's a pseudo diverticula, false diverticula. What other kinds of diverticula do you know in the esophagus? Yes, epiphrenic traction diverticular excellent. You guys are amazing. So this is Zenkers. This is traction epiphrenic, just a ep malet above malen, upon malen. Ep means above or upon. So epiphrenic means above the diaphragm. So one area, this is a diaphragm, above the diaphragm, epiphrenic. It's also somehow a pulsion diverticular. It's because of increased intraluminal pressure, it's just pulsion. The anchors is also due to increased intraluminal pressure, so epiphrenic. And the other one is mid chest, right? Around the mediastinum. One of you said traction. So this is the anchors, you can see it's up in the upper segment of the esophagus. This is in the mid esophagus. You see this diverticula. It's because of fibrosis, and then the esophagus is being pulled towards the mediastinum to the hilum. So patients with tuberculosis or any other fibrotic lesions, they can develop traction diverticular. This is a true diverticular because all the layers are being pulled. The entire layer is being pulled. So this is traction. That's why we call this traction because it's as a result of pulling or traction. And this is typical epiphrenic. We call it epiphrenic because you can see the diaphragm here. It's above the diaphragm, there is protrusion. You see the diverticular. This is the diverticular right here, and this is the diverticular right here, okay? Three different types of diverticular. The same thing, epiphrenic, because it's above the diaphragm. This is around the mediastinum, so it's called traction. This is in the neck, then curse. Very good. What kind of study is this? What kind of study is this? Uh, follow through, yeah, it could be follow through. Follow, no, follow, follow through, barring, follow through, barring, follow through, barring, follow through. 
Yeah, and basically you see barium, barium meal now, right? So cadem manal. No, this is not barium in You see the stomach. This is the stomach, man. So this is the stomach. This is the duodenum. This is the small bowel. So the pelvis is here. So you are dealing with an upper GI series now. So the stomach is well visualized. So most probably this is a barium meal. And now barium meal hono with follow through. So most of the time barium meal is follow through. Oh, most of the time they do it for Ephraim, uh, Ephraim, uh, Ephraim, Ephraim, Ephraim Bala, you can go ahead. Talk to me. I see your hand raised. Ephraim Bala, do you have a question? I am not far away, Ephraim, okay, that's fine. So this is a stomach. So most of the time people used to do this, like, you know, any gastric pathology sinor and uh, pergi pathology sinor is several. So like it could be PUD, it could be malignancy, it could be ulcer lesions. And then, thanks to the advent of upper GI endoscopy, uh, we don't, I mean, most people do not really do this, right? And now uh, you go ahead and do upper GI endoscopy, right and left upper GI endoscopy. So whatever pathology you are dealing with, you can diagnose with upper GI endoscopy. Still, it could be indicated small bowel uh, lesions. Menam sinoru upper jaw endoscopy mekniatum skadio denam eto sana parte grasno meda. You cannot go beyond a certain point. Selazi, if you are suspecting like jejunal pathology, whatever, or the rest of the small bowel, you can still do capsule endoscopy. Capsule endoscopy and the capsule no come around patient to swallow other guy. Then you take the image. We take the camera image small and now and camera on the top because that way muta the small bonus can it done that capsule endoscopy can be done in our in our country i don't think capsule endoscopy is yet available i'm not sure if i'm wrong you will correct me if it is available but it's available here right and left so barium and follow through and things like this are all the studies there is capsule endoscopy that's beautiful I didn't know that. Thank you so much. So capsule, capsule endoscopy can be done. I'm so happy that it's available. Uh, to my knowledge, it was not available. It has been a while since I left, so there will be a change, obviously. So barium male tracing, you can see the, fundi, the fundus air would always be there. It could be there because air just like tends to float on top of the contrast agent. So you see the incisor angularis here. You see the antral part. You see the... Uh, pyloric sphincter, you see the duodenal valve, and you interpret like if there is any ulceration, ulcer crater, if there is a filling defect due to mass lesion, <coughs> all these kinds of pathologies can be diagnosed. If there is pyloric stenosis and all that, GO, <coughs> you can do barium milk if there is GO and all that. But all this can be diagnosed by a per day, GI endoscopy, which is better. So, what do you see here? Barium meal, right? So what has happened to the stomach? Uh, not there is no feeling defect. And as hey, what a touch lower than what did the tata tau contrast uh settle slider radano? T pot deformity, not exactly. Yet nello, ruge rugeo chumata yetalo bacho basi. And now yet nello stricture now dilatation. It's in the pelvic cavity, right? So the stomach is hanging down. Imagine, kazi, it doesn't make any problem. It's in the pelvic cavity, so pelvic stomach. So this kind of pathologies are seen. There is what a condition known as uh, stomach ptosis or something like that. If I am not wrong, just Google it and double check. I think it's called stomach ptosis. Ptosis or not? so it's kind of like you know the stomach would be hanging into the pelvic cavity. The other is if a patient has uh, long-standing uh, GO, sometimes like you know their stomach will be distended and distended and it could be pelvic reaching. Uh. Yeah, gastro, I think gastro, gastrotosis, gastrotosis, yes. 
I'm right. So uh, patients with gastroenteritis, they may have like pelvic reaching uh, stomach, <coughs> like this one. Uh, these are rare. But don't worry about this. And then do you that I'm the lamat and I'm the mouth at the channel. Common things are common. So here in Gilik at the message you know. So bare minimal kasaran part of chun of tata mutala chura such to say come and many. This is a normal bare minimal. If you know the normal, then you will know the abnormal. What is the diagnosis? Hirschsprung's disease, dilated bowel loops with baremineimas one neck appearance, right? So the proximal part is significantly dilated, and the distal part where the plexus is missing, you see narrowing or transition point, uh, you know, Aladdin. It's proximal dilatation, distal narrowing, and the transition point, Tajan. And you can see on plain X ray, hugely dilated bowel loops. So how do patients with Hirsch's Hirsch Sprung's disease present to you? With long-standing constipation, are they? Long-standing constipation in a child. And now what is the cause? Do you know the cause of Hirsch's Sprung's disease? A failure to pass meconium if you know it. Yeah, that can happen. <clears throat> Most of the time they present late, are they? A ganglionic megacolon, no, yeah. No ganglion. What kind of ganglion is missing? Be specific, guys. There are two types of ganglions in the bar. Mm -hmm. Which ganglion is which ganglion is missing? Uh, Mesners? Not exactly. Not the Mesners. The myenteric plexus, yes, the myenteric, or what is the other name for myenteric plexus? What is the other name for myenteric plexus? Or back plexus, excellent. Or back plexus or myenteric plexus. Is it in the muscle layer or sub submucosa? Where do you find it? In the muscular propria, muscular layer, right? In the muscular propria, in the muscle proper. It's myenteric, muscle Myenteric plexus is found in the muscular propria. The other name is orbax plexus. So if it is missing, then it's if a patient, child presents with chronic constipation, dilation, Progressive abdominal dilatation, swan neck, neck deformity in the in the barium enema. So how do you diagnose uh, Hirsch's Sprung's disease? It's biopsy, biopsy, biopsy. So suction biopsy. So I have never seen this this thing, but it says rectal mucosal suction biopsy again. So I have taken a biopsy, but what we do is like you know we somehow use anoscope, try to find the rectum and uh, take a biopsy from the rectum. We take rectal biopsy, I've done that when I was rotating through uh, pediatrics, uh, pediatric surgery, when I was a general surgery resident. Uh, we didn't have this gun or a rectal mucosal suction biopsy gun and labyrinth. Then it has to be seen to pathology, then they will tell you the ganglia is missing. Do you know the type of surgeries I do? Let it now, we'll have now a low with the lamanagro, Kalatana, the Rachwin, we'll have a Zeno, we'll have a lacho. Artman's what? Colostomy? All right. What kind of surgery do you do? Colostomy? Colostomy could be a temporary major, but not uh, really a preferred way. In the colostomy? <clears throat> what do you call it? The definitive treatment. What is the definitive? Myomectomy. No. Myomectomy, malad ko masalun makurat malad. Pediatric surgery in the nalastamarachun. 
Kolo anala anastomosis. Pull through, excellent antenna. Pull through procedure. So you remove the aganglionic segment. Malat aganglion, uh, aganglionic segment to quartan and nautana. We do pull through procedure. Malano. We just take the proximal part. The proximal part has like, you know, the the plexuses, right? So distal segment to know, and part out of we do the anastomosis. We call it pull through procedure. Maybe you have never seen it. At least if you mention the name, that's enough. What do you see in this belly? It's obviously a small child. Do you see this? Visible peristalsis, right? Where's the visible peristalsis? In a child who is vomiting, vomiting, vomiting immediately after eating, and then gets relieved. This is a peristalsis, it's not a mass, it's a peristaltic wave going on. And I'm giving you the history. A newborn male child vomiting, vomiting, non bilas vomiting, and uh, gets relief after the vomiting and becomes hungry again and tries to suck again, takes up the cramp again, vomits, and pyloric stenosis is very typical. How do you diagnose pyloric stenosis? You can do ultrasound. One sign is target sign. The other one is you can see that, that this is the wall of the pylorus. It's elongated and thickened pylorus, and you see the lumen is narrowed. So there is pyloric stenosis. Look in the Georgian amnomy, you know, and, uh, and the GO you know, manifest in the So complication of childhood, most common between two weeks and two months is now projectile and bilas vomiting immediately after feeding can happen in Marago. So you have to ask the mother. So what happens immediately after he feeds, he throws up. It's projectile and bilas. And you see some mass. So olive appear, olive shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. When you palpate, you may appreciate some mass on physical examination. And the complication is due to the vomiting of gastric acid. They may develop hypochromic, hypochloremic because they miss, uh, they uh, lose hydrochloric acid, and they will have metabolic alkalosis because they are uh, losing acid. Gastric acid is being lost. Ultrasound can diagnose it or upper GI series can diagnose it. So hyper, no, not hypocalcemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Just like patients with GO. Patients with GO may, may also complicate with hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. With paradoxical aciduria, added, typical paradoxical aciduria in or actually in the urine. Read about that. If you read Bailey and Labs, you'll get it there. There is an explanation for paradoxical aciduria in GO. Read Bailey and Labs. So this is typical. You can read it for yourself. This is the mass you are describing. Somebody was talking about the mass. So when you palpate, there will be an olive-shaped mass sitting in the right upper quadrant. You can see the peristalsis going on, OK? You can see the peristalsis going on. So let me show you a couple of slides and maybe we will better stop because we have spent a lot of time and uh, still there is a lot of lot of slides. I don't know, maybe we might need to find another, another day. Double bubble sign, differential diagnosis, excellent. Tell me differential diagnosis. Double bubble sign, duodenal atresia, mirigat volvulus, excellent. Anular pancreas, okay. Anular pancreas, mirgat volvulus, duodenal. How does the patient present? How does this newborn with present to you? Presenting sign. What is the main comp? Bilas vomiting. Excellent. Bilas vomiting. Unlike pyloric stenosis. Excellent. What do you see here? What kind of X-ray is this? Give me your diagnosis. <sighs> KUB, do you see any pathology? So we call it KUB because we can see the kidney projection, the ureteric projection, and the bladder projection. Kidney, ureter, bladder. No pathology, excellent, Zaka. Excellent, excellent. There is no pathology. We don't see anything. This is normal. 
So gastric gas, gas in the stomach, gas plus, plus stool burden in the descending colon, liver age is here, you see the liver here, hepatic flexure around here, you know, sacrum around here, you know, rectal gas shadow over here. So normal, normal, normal KV. Any pathology in this one? Of course, there is one. Somebody is pointing here. What is going on here? The stone, yes, the stone. What else? Differential diagnosis. Give me differential diagnosis. Left, left renal, renal stone. Do you think that's the renal stone? I'm like, clothes, clothes, less likely. Clothes. Do you think this is renal or where? Where do you think is the stone? Ureter, it looks like ureter because it's very close to this, uh, the iliac crest. It looks like the ureter. Unless like, you know, uh, undescended, uh, and, uh, and, uh, no. Whether I ascend the other kidney canon. The kidneys develop in the pelvis, right? As I ascend up. And then there is a horse shoe kidney canon somewhere in the pelvis. And then ectopic kidney, excellent. That's the right terminology. Thank you, Mary. So it looks like a stone differential diagnosis. Could it be something else? What about a fecal ease? A fecal matter which has appeared as if it is like, you know, stone. So fecal it can also behave like this, right? What else could it be? Differential diagnosis, guys. Come on, you know this. Differential diagnosis, what about foreign body? Is it possible, yes or no? It could be a foreign body, it could be which has been swallowed and coming down, yes. It could be a bullet, excellent, yes. It could be a bullet, retained bullet. Could be a foreign body which has been swallowed and not descending down. It could be a fecalis, it could be a stone. What we can see is there is an abnormal radio peak shadow, right? That's how you describe, you should describe it. So when you describe it, okay, I see this is a KV of a patient and I see some abnormal radio peak shadow, differential diagnosis, most probably it's, it's ureteric stone because it is in the ureteric projection. This is a ureteric projection. And I think it's a ureteric stone. But differential includes, it could be a fecalis, it could be a retained foreign body like bullet, it could be a swallowed foreign body which is descending down. If you say this, I will hug you in the middle of the exam. So that's how you, I want you to answer, okay, please. So you have to impress your examiners and you have to think this way when you are dealing with a patient, differential, think, think, think. That's what Professor Schneider always says, right? So we should be thinkers and analyzers. We, are, we shouldn't be mechanics, right? So what about here? What do you think is going on? Just like I said, so I described, it, described the other X-ray as a KV with an abnormal radio peak shadow. And I think differential, most important differential diagnosis is right kidney stone because it's in the kidney projection. So most probably it's a renal stone. They will appreciate you. Ceylon will appreciate you for that. Or Dr. Masai, Dr. Andualam, Dr. Badri, they would appreciate you for that. They might even give you a position in neurology as a future candidate, huh? So in present. So stone disease. So stone disease, you may you may find a stone within the parenchyma. You may find it in the pelvic cell system. You may find it in the pelvic cell system. This is a renal pelvis. You may find the stone in the pelvis, the renal pelvis. You may find the stone at the junction between the ureter and the renal pelvis. We call it pelvic ureteric junction. So PUJ obstruction, I mean, pelvic ureteric junction obstruction, PUJ obstruction. So this stone, if it is sitting there, it results in PUJ obstruction. Pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. <coughs> That's an emergency because it will destroy this kidney due to hydronephrosis if you don't remove it. Where is the stone? It looks like in the bladder, right? So always, always when you are like suspecting a stone disease, start with KUB. We call it a scout film or a control film. 
So the first film you take before any contrast study to the genital urinary tract should be a plain X-ray of the abdomen, KUB. That's because if there is any shadow, you don't want to confuse yourself. So if you see some contrast coming, so this could be a retained contrast or it could be a radio or shadow. That's why you need to have a control X-ray. If you have KUB, you see this shadow, then when you do subsequent IVP or IVU or whatever, retrogressive retrography, whatever, then you can tell and differentiate between a contrast and a radio picture, like a stone, okay? So always start with KUB. That is the reason why you need to have a control X-ray. So this is also another beautifully outlined Egg, egg shell, and muscle, uh, bladder stone, no, which is big. It is growing big because, like, you know, the bladder is a huge cavity, so it has enough time to grow and grow and grow. Okay. So, bladder stone, bladder stone. So, what is this? Now I need a diagnosis for this one. Staghorn. Yes, staghorn calculator. Excellent. So, we don't see any contrast agent. It could also be contrast, right? so retained contrast leonichelal with PUJ. If there is PUJ obstruction, you don't see the contrast going down because there is obstruction at the PUJ, and uh, this could be the dilated pelvic cell system. One can argue like that one. But if somebody tells you this is a plain abdominal X-ray and you see this one, this is a standard calculi. And you can see there is no contrast, you can see Stagorn calculate bilaterally, and this is how it appears. So, if it was a contrast study, not a stone, this is hydronephrosis, right? Bilateral hydronephrosis, and probably PUG obstruction or proximal ureteric obstruction because you don't see any contrast going down. If it was a contrast study, but this is a plain study. And there is another one, most probably another stone down there. So, Stagorn calculate in the right, Stagorn calculate in the left. Very unfortunate to the patient. So this is a bladder stone, this is how they take it out. Okay, open cystostomy, paratomy, cystostomy, you take out, you grab it, you take it out. Okay, let's, uh, let's finish this urologic image and then uh, it will be enough for today because like I have a lot of other slides in other specialties for your short exam, as well as viva, including an instrument. But I think I'm getting tired, plus it will also be too much for you guys, almost 100 slides until now. So you can see what kind of study is this, IVP, intravenous pilography, or they call it IVU, intravenous urography. So you can see beautifully the pelvic calicial system, right? You can see the calices, which are not obliterated, very beautiful, concave shaped. Very beautifully outlined. You can see the renal pelvis, which is not dilated. You can see beautifully the ureter. There is no sign of stricture or obstruction. Contrast is going down. There is no narrowing, no feeling defect, okay? That's an IVP. So this is a normal IVP. So you can see the pelvic alicial system, which are normal. They are not blunt. They are not obliterated. They are not blunted. They are concave shaped. And you can see the pelvic alicell, the pelvis, that's very beautiful, renal pelvis. You can see the ureter very well outlined. You can see the bladder. So this is an IVP, intravenous pilography, intravenous urography, okay? Those terminologies are possible. That's normal. What's abnormal here? Or is it normal? Normal, abnormal. Two ureters, which side, right, left, Saganish. So left side, you got it. So the pelvic cell system, there is no sign of hydronephrosis, but you see double pelvis, right? And double, double ureter. So duplicate system, yeah, congenital anomaly, no? So what do you see here, spot diagnosis? for diagnosis. Yeah, but specific, Mary, be specific because it's, uh, you are right, it's hydronephrosis. It's not only hydronephrosis and there is a lot to be described. So it's bilateral. Dilated ureter. Ureter, yes. 
mega ureter, right? So you have hydro ureter and hydronephrosis, bilateral hydro ureter and hydronephrosis. So the pelvic calicial system I showed you, right? So these are like, you see them? They are not planted, they are thin. They are like, you know, somehow concave shaped. In the interior, they are concave. So when you come here, it's completely gone. That is blunted. The pelvic, the pelvis is so dilated. The pelvic calicial system dilatation and you know, blunting when clubbing and you know, it's just like blunted like this. There are no more concave, and it's bilateral. And you see the ureter, which is super, super dilated. So this is a normal ureter, you see? It's not dilated, but here, this, the ureter is so dilated bilaterally. So bilateral hydrourator and hydro nephrosis and it's a, you see it's it has become so redundant torches on all the blood and the ureter on outline star with skinking <coughs> so bilateral hydro ureter with hydro nephrosis so that means the obstruction is down there man and downstream no man no effect too so where is the pathology the pathology the obstruction is down there so if i ask you differential diagnosis can you give me differential diagnosis for this patient BPH, excellent. What else? Bladder cancer, excellent. BPH, bladder stone. Yes, bladder stone is also the other one. What else? BPH, prostatic cancer, ureteral stricture, excellent. What else? If it is a child, if I tell you this, it's not a child, but if it was a child, what, what, what would it be? PUV, excellent. Then PUV, posterior ureteral valve, the name has been changed, right? They call it COPAM, right? Congenital obstructive menomen. Congenital obstructive posterior ureteral membrane amibalar copam C O P U M. I think the name is changed to copam because it's a membrane. It's no more a valve below. Describe a congenital obstructive. Yes, uh, obstructive posterior ureteral membrane. So copam amibalar or the drone is the move, uh, tenipala, posterior ureteral valve. You are excellent, Sarah. So, vesicular ureteric reflux. So, if a patient has bilateral vesicular ureteric reflux, so this is how they manifest, okay? Excellent, excellent, guys. What's the diagnosis here? So, you see only the left one, the right, where is the right one? Where did it go? Don't read the notes. Challenge yourself, don't read, don't cheat. Solitary kidney, it could be solitary kidney. What else could it be? Nephrectomy, it could be nephrectomy. What, could, what else could it be? Maybe the right kidney is knocked out. It's no more functioning. It's no more functioning. So we call it non-functional right kidney, right? So when you report, don't commit yourself. This is like right nephrectomy, don't commit yourself. You can say in this X-ray what I see is right hydrourator with hydronephrosis and non-visualized right kidney. It's not visualized. Non-visualized right kidney and right ureter with left hydronephrosis and hydrourator. Then the differential diagnosis for the non-visualized kidney could be nephrotomy, previous nephrotomy. It could be non-functional kidney. The right kidney could be knocked out. It's no more functional, okay? So what do you see here? So the pelvic calicial system is beautiful right here, right? So there is no problem. So pelvic calicial system is okay. Pelvis is okay. The ureters are visualized. There is no problem. Where is the problem? The problem is in the bladder, right? What is the problem? The answer is right here. It's a feeling defect. So what are the differentials? Somebody says bladder tumor. Bladder tumor can give you a feeling defect, yes. Bladder stone is also another differential diagnosis. Most of the time, the stone itself becomes like somehow radiopic, but it can give you a feeling defect as well sometimes. So it could be a stone, it could be a bladder tumor. In this case, this particular patient had bladder tumor with feeling defect, and the pathology is well below down there, and it's not obstructing the ureteral orifices, so there is no secondary effect as a result of that. If this tumor was ob ob obstructing the ureteric orifice, you may see hydroureter and hydronephrosis in the left side, at least the right side is far away from the tumor. So that could have happened. 
Okay, what is this? What do you see, guys? What is the abnormality you see there? Stent. A stent. What kind of stent is that? Is it coronary? J stent. Okay, yes, it is a J stent, but this one has typical name. JJ or double J. Why is it called JJ? Because there is a J in the other end. There is another J in the other end. It's called a double J stent or a JJ stent. Because there could also be a J stent. Only the J would be in one end and the other one may be straight. So in that case, you will have a J stent. If you have this curl, pigtail, ayinat nagar karlachu, boz ends, that's a double J stent. So it appears, you see, there is one J, there is one J. So this J is situated where? In the renal pelvis. And this one is situated where? In the bladder. Yeah, space has fell the one, coil the marks. It has to go, guide wire and straight one on the other. Here is a guide wire. You have a guide wire, straight one on the other. And does it add fully gabal in the guide wire? When you remove this wire or whatever the guide up, Yes, and coil monitor So if it coils, they know that they are in the renal pelvis under fluoroscopy. Then the other end has to coil in the bladder, the other one in the renal pelvis. So this is a very beautiful demonstration. So it's coiling in the renal pelvis, it's coiling in the bladder, and you see here a stone. There is a ureteric stone. So people may ask you, what are the indications to put a JJ stent following ureteric surgery, following ESWL, extracorporal, check wave lithotripsy, okay, following ureteroscopy, especially SW in Saracona, you break the stones. Those broken stones will come down as a line, lined up, and don't touch their vessel fully of the Stone stress in a man of French metacolage, Tacotalacho. Tassel for your digital. When they can potentially cause ureteric reconstruction, and you don't want that to happen, that's why you put a J stint. It prevents complete, complete obstruction due to the passage of a stone. You see, stone kuch villain, this stint is allowing the urine to trickle down. So you avoid complete obstruction, okay? Very good. Okay, urology in Jarspigiallo, has she? So, pelvic cavity matichallo, this is the anatomy of the urethra. So, posterior urethra laziga or proximal urethra minnello. That includes the prosthetic urethra and membranous urethra. Membranous, kazichka prostate with the cabalas, kaziska tasamara dress and lechunat, pelvic diaphragm dress. Swa membranous the balalaj, prostate male me quarreto, prosthetic balal. Kazabata chalo he carver regoziga, balbari bala uretra, kaza with a penal shaft in minato, penal uretra bala. So distal uretra, balbari uretra nana, penal uretra in chamber, anterior uretra bala, posterior uretra uretra, when proximal uretra demo, membrana senana, prosthetic uretra in chamber malano. That's very important, relevant in an anatomy mark. You have a detailed description of the anatomy, so you can get it later on. You can see every detail. So this is a balbari uretra. Surrounded by the uh, bulb. This is a membranous part. This is a membranous part. And you have got the prosthetic part. The prostate is the prosthetic. The membranous is the membranous part. So you can kind of guess where I am going, right? So, what kind of study is this? Cystoidal program. Uh, so this is just like you know urethrocystography, right? Urethro, 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 cystography, malen. Urethra on and now we are trying to outline the urethra and the bladder. So this is a urethra. So the this is a penile urethra. This is a bulbar part. This is a membranous part. This is a membranous part, and this is a prosthetic part. And here you have the here you have the bladder. Okay, so it's kind of normal, normal. Hono, ziga tenish structure alay masla. Ziga kabi tabbe masla. So better X-ray chalo. So you can see the penile urethra is fine, the bulbar urethra is fine. There is no structure. This is the bulbar part. This is the penile part. 
And here you see narrowing, right? So the contrast is not going, because, you know, inject me there ago. Retro, retrograde, no. Retrograde, retrocystography. No. Retrograde, because you are injecting the contrast through the penis, Malan. No. That's why they are called uh, retro, uh, retrograde, uh, retrocystography. No. The other counterpart is voiding cystoretrography. So if somebody has like, you know, suprapubic catheter, you inject the, cathe the contrast through the suprapubic catheter and you ask the patient to strain as if he or, or she is trying to pass urine. Then it has to go down normally if they are able to pass it. But if there is a stricture, it can't. So that's called voiding cysto cystoerythrography. Patient is trying to void the contrast agent. Uh, the other way is like, you know, you inject it, the contrast into the urethra through a catheter, into the bladder through a catheter, and you ask them to void. And then while they are trying, attempting to void, you can't take the x-ray. That's also called cystoerythrography, okay? So there is definitely, in the membranous part, there is some obstruction. So I will show you better pictures. So you can definitely see there is a, a, stricture, a stricture over here, right? So normal caliber, smooth caliber, but it's ragged over here, so there is Retral structure going on here around the bulbar urethra, most probably. So another another picture. What is this? Is it, are we dealing with this picture? What's going on? A complete disruption, Adam. Mm -hmm. Trauma, most disrupted. Excellent with that. It's complete. The urethra is completely disrupted. It's disconnected. So it's distracted. So most probably, like, you know, there is an injury, pelvic injury most of the time, with subsequent urethral injury. So the urethra is completely detached. So that is the reason why, always, in a trauma victim, especially in a pelvic trauma, if you see a significant pelvic bone fracture, always make sure that there is no urethral injury before you attempt to catheterize the patient. One clue is look at the penile shaft. Penile tip. If you see blood coming through the penile tip, then definitely there is pelvic injury associated with urethral injury. So if there is blood at the tip of the penis during your examination, don't attempt catheterization. So urologists can may attempt because they are experts. Even if they complicate, they do know how to fix it. But in general, if you are not a qualified urologist or a qualified surgeon who can deal with further complications, don't try to attempt to catheterize a pelvic trauma patient with evidence of blood coming through the, the urethral meatus, okay? Through the tip of the penis. Don't. So if a patient is complaining of like urinary retention following trauma, there is significant fracture of the pelvic bones. You see that on X-ray. Patient is telling you that I cannot urinate, I'm dying, I'm in pain. Then you have to resort for what? What do you do? If you cannot cut, I say don't catheterize, don't attempt. What can you do for that person? Until you can refer him or her to the uh, supra pubic catheter, yes. Until you refer them to urologic center, you have to do supra pubic cystostomy. That's very good. I'm almost finishing. This is another <coughs> uh, uh, urethrography. You can see stricture, definitely there is a stricture. It looks like a bulbar part of the urethra is affected. So there is another stricture. So it's a repetition. So this is endoscopic view of the stricture. So when you do cystoscopy, this is how you see the narrowing. So it's so narrow. You can see the lumen. It's very narrow. So how do you manage urethral stricture? If it is short segment, anterior urethra is involved, how do they manage it most of the time? <clears throat> Have you ever seen this procedure being done? The OR, or in the minor OR for that matter. What is the best management if it is a, if it is accessible? You should answer this. Urethrotomy, right? Cystoscopy, you do cystoscopy, you see the narrowing, then you cut through the stricture. If it is a short segment anterior, so you can treat with urotrotomy. We call it urotrotomy. Just cut through the strictures, the stricture segment, and it will be, you know, wide open. So the other one is bujinage. Have you ever seen a bujinage? Buji, metallic buji. 
So it's a common procedure, especially those patients. <clears throat> Typically, say, what kind of history do you ask if a patient comes with urethral stricture? One common important question you should ask to consider differential. STI, history of STI, most importantly, gonorrhea infection, right? Gonorrhea, poorly treated, uh, inadequately treated, gonorrhea infection in the past or recurrent gonorrhea in the past is like, that is a long-term sequelae of having gonorrhea, repeated gonorrhea attack, which was not adequately treated is the stricture. So those are short segment and maybe they can be treated with urethrotomy. That's the best because it's then under direct visualization. You see it, you cut through it. The other one is a blind metallic instrumentation. Buji can be inserted. <coughs> so Buji notch can be done. Okay, I think we discussed a lot, but like I was going to neurosurgery right now and GI and everything are still there. So I think it's, uh, we have taken a long time. I'm also kind of tired and I don't think we should continue. Uh, there is a lot of interesting pictures and a lot of interesting discussion, which I think is relevant to your examination and as well as your uh, future practice. So my suggestion to you guys is like, you know, if you can have another time, which is like, you know, convenient for you guys, it could be late at night or like, I can wait until my next week's uh, day off and uh, try to do that for you. Okay, we can do that. Thank you, uh, Nansa Gar. Yeah, my name is Lam, and I wish you all the best. So uh, I will take five minutes because you guys were asking me, uh, Zaga was telling me to advise you <coughs> on how to prepare for the examination. Like I said last week in Dalkut, Yamajam Marayanagar, stress and avoid Maragno, systematic mono, systematic mono, metana button mono, rasen mono, time frame mono at no, program mono at no, Kazavata Rafa. Uh, stress minimum salamay takmachu, stress that tuni, but then you chachu and progress in Yayachu and performance in Yayachu at Chanaku uh, and the uh, telek example in Satachao. La quali yatavala, material is seva savalaran, he mendon no handout is seva saval, PowerPoint is seva saval, mess avoch is seva savalu. Uh, in my time, can ever fit in a baran de bachust and the legend as this is a vessel, is a vessel, but la quali yalujoch is a total simmer rape or mulujoch. Yes, I was a scammed, a locality and a quality. Now, Moltwal, Dormu, Kumsat and Takala, a quality tableau at a seven seven, yet Jackie or a cat, Mats Ahift, PowerPoint, transparency copy. Kaza, look in the attachment talco, look back on quality preparation, the Jammer Nolo, your quality material to let see cuffed, he freaked out. He literally freaked out because it was a lot, yes, I was a material. Then he just disappeared. This is not a joke. But at the I remember, and the we are in the middle of a pandemic, Selazi, but I'm Buzufatanasla Bachu, but a Shalamatan, Lara Sachu, time so too, take care of yourself. Uh, adequate time and calculate matanyat mamo karno program out at no lela mamo kalla pachuna ka kulu na managar cover maragat chulu ma I assure you we cannot cover everything but bane yon bachu ayonem kulu na cover maragat ma ita bachu hum salazi basic yon utena na common yon utena nagaroch kawa kachu fatana ulai basalam na bate na koyi kachu edachu. Participate in this your chance of passing is almost 99%. So let's see. Don't overthink, uh, don't worry too much. And now, because I'm going to say, 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 I'm going to Matayakano, Kazavata Rafa, help each other, and one doon a source of contagious your attention and looking at someone a little bit, and one doon mother tat me a little bit, and I help each other. But Rafa, I'll see you next time. I hope this session was helpful. Now we'll continue discussing the rest of the slides, okay? Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye bye.